Well, hello, folks, and welcome to the Dieter Melhorn Fishing Podcast. I hope you're having a good day, whatever day it is that you happen to be listening or watching the podcast. Some of you are now watching it on YouTube. Welcome. Appreciate you making the jump over here. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube and don't know, this podcast is available in traditional podcast form on all the podcast platforms. And it's Dieter Melhorn Fishing. So uh, go check it out, whichever way you came from. If you're new, welcome. I appreciate you dropping by. And uh, if you're a return visitor, thanks for coming back. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for downloading the podcast. All of the information for the podcast, YouTube channel, my guide service, the fishing gear I use, and how to get a hold of me is available on my website, DieterMelhornFishing.com. Go there and check it out, and you can check out all the gear we use, guide trips if you're in the Carolinas and interested in something like that. And there's links to all this other stuff, the podcast and the YouTube channel. Today, today's podcast, we're actually talking, we got a guest, and uh, it's a guy that I sat down with, Billy Claybo. He's out in eastern Tennessee, uh, Captain Billy Claybo. He is a fishing guide out there in eastern Tennessee, and I uh, sat down with him at the Catapalooza Fishing Show out in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Uh, make sure you make plans to be there uh, when it comes around in June. And uh, it's interesting to talk to. The man has a mind like a steel trap. I'll give you an example. Um, a lot of times when we're taping these podcasts, we'll have some little glitch. A camera will die, a battery die. We had a, bat- we had a, a camera die in part of this that we were taping. And Billy was in the middle of saying something. And I said, hey, we've got to change the battery. And he's like, oh, okay. We go back and I said, all right, let's get started. And he said, I remember where I was at. When I edited that thing, he literally picked up with a sentence I stopped him in. Verbatim, amazing mind. Uh, The guy remembers a lot. He's fun to talk to. Uh, He fishes for a lot of different stuff too. It's not just catfish. Catfish is kind of his thing there in Eastern Tennessee, but he fishes for a lot of different species, which we're going to talk about. The Tennessee River is full of all kinds of, of crazy fish and he has caught them and as i jokingly say he knows the spot where you can find them so i hope you sit back and enjoy this podcast with captain billy claybo of east tennessee so let's go back to the beginning little billy <laughs> where'd you grow up at tell us about your childhood um i grew up in knoxville tennessee where i live right now in fact i live in the house that I grew up in. I bought it from my parents. Oh, very cool. Very cool. So you're born and raised from this area then. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. What, as a kid, were, are you in a place where you got to go outside? Not everybody got to do it as a kid. Not everybody was in the country where they could fish. What was that like as far as the outdoors goes? Yeah, I literally had a creek in my backyard or in my neighbor's backyard. My neighbor had, I don't know, 200 acres and he allowed me to romp around on that. There was a pond next door. I fished in that pond and there was a creek in the very back. I remember some of my, you know, craziest memories was like when that creek had flooded, I could throw out worms and catch like shiners all day long. And then when there's nothing there, you got like, you know, darters and smaller fish. And I caught I think it was a green sunfish that was probably a state record. It was the absolute biggest like sunfish I have ever seen. I, I couldn't believe it and I, I just released it back in the water. But I mean, like it was, you know, it was probably maybe that big, but I, you know, memory makes me think it was that big, but absolutely enormous. What was your earliest memory of catching a fish? You told us about that giant world record nine pound sunfish. What was the earliest memory you have of catching a just- fish? I don't know, I, I remember quite a bit. Yeah. And like, I literally remember the first bluegill I caught with my mom. And it was just like, a, you know, one of those awakening times. It was just, it was so awesome catching, catching it. And my, you know, my mom was the fisherman of the family. You know, a lot of people, their dads take them fishing or whatever, but my mom literally was the fisherman. My dad, whenever we'd go fishing, my dad was in the chair asleep and I was romping around trying to catch fish around rocks or whatever. And my mom was the one awake, just, you know, watching me and catching the fish. That's cool that it was your mom, because for me, I lost my dad when I was nine, 10 years old. And, but my mom fished and she would go fishing. She would take me fishing. And it was kind of the same thing there. Uh, 
what did she fish for? What was she into? Was she just, just whatever? I mean, she was, my mom's actually from Vermont. Yep. It's, uh, it's a story I don't think I've ever really told anybody on my channel, but they met through the newspaper. Yeah. Like my dad's from here, from Powell, Tennessee, and they were writing letters back and forth. They met through the newspaper, were writing letters, and he went up there, married her, brought her down here, and they've been together almost 50 years now. Wow, what a cool story. Yeah. That's a, so uh, she, up there in Vermont, fished for trout all the time. And every other summer, we would drive up there to see my grandmother, and I would fish in Vermont. I still have perfect memory of some of the spots up there. Like catching a, I remember this one little creek. I dropped my worm straight down under the rock I was standing on. The rock was moving and pulled the trout from under it. I just, I, one of those crazy things. I remember there was a, uh, a, a dam where you could throw the worm into the water, catch a trout. Worm in the water, bullhead. Worm in the water, largemouth bass. Worm in the water, bluegill. It was like a different fish every single time. And we recently went back there. We went. My mom wanted, you know, at least one last trip up there yeah. to see my aunt. And we went up there and we were driving down this road and I'm like, what's, what's this road? Yeah. You know, I was like, uh, we're going to turn down this road. I think that dam's down there. My parents were like, what? No, no, there's no way you could remember that. Drove right up That's to there. it. Yeah. It imprinted you that yeah. much. Yeah. yeah. I've heard that from a lot of people I've talked to doing this is that there are, it's almost like it's, something primal in that whether it's hunting fishing you have that moment that connection where it's just like boom it it drives it home so have you with some people there's like gaps in their fishing they, they fish when they're young with parents grandparents and they go to school go to college get a job and then get back into it mm. what's been your story there have you been fishing the entire time or did you have M most of the entire time i mean i had a gap when i first got out of high school and started you know my career that kind of crashed and burned so i ended up with a different career and during the in my younger years I, during that time frame i didn't fish as much but i've been on and off my entire life you know started up again maybe i don't know it was about 10 years ago i guess i started getting back into it heavy again what brought and, you back um just i like fishing i mean <laughs> i like you know just going out there and trying to catch whatever I can. Uh, a lot of times I do go for the big fish or whatever, but sometimes just going out there catching even the little ones is fun. Now, uh, when you got back into it, were you into catfish like you are now, or were you just fishing the fish? Um, I started fishing the fish, and then I gradually went into catfishing because you know, I realized how sometimes tedious bass fishing can be, and I, I just you know, wanted something a little bit you know, more relaxing. So I went into the catfish and then I started going for muskies and you know, that's the fish of 10,000 casts. However, being incredibly lucky catching a 50 incher within the first six months of me starting to do muskie fishing, which was incredible. I mean, a yeah. buddy of mine told me it took him like 20 years. Oh so yeah, no, that's an amazing, I don't know a lot about musk, but I know when you start getting in that, that many inches, that is a huge, yeah. huge fish. Oh, yeah. So. When did you realize, because you're talking about musk, you're talking about striper, you're talking about catfish, small mouth, you got all these fish. When did you realize you were like in the, the, the promised land here of, of fishing in North America? And well, fresh water? I think I've known that my entire life that this is the promised land or whatever, because there's just so many lakes around me. I mean, you, you know, Milton Hill, Fort Loudon, Watts Bar, Teleco, Douglas, Norris. Uh, and then Chickabonga, you got Nigga Jack. I mean, it's just an incredible fishery around here. Just so many lakes, just so close to me. And I knew that, you know, early on. What do you think it is that makes Eastern Tennessee, Tennessee River so great like it is for so many different species of fish? I think TBA, the dam system, the, the dams and everything. We got all these dams and then you have the dams create lakes. So you got the lake style fish. And then there's still the rivers, the Clinch River, the Emory River, the Tennessee River, the Little Tennessee, um, all the other feeders, the French Broad, the Holston, all of this just creates just possibilities of every type of fish. For people that don't know Eastern Tennessee and the fishing, take us through, let's start in January, and take us through the year as to what you can catch, 
when it's good, when it's bad, with the different species? I know that's a big, broad question, but, yeah, Janu- it is. but January, it's cold. Water temperatures are probably pretty dang chilly up here. What works and what doesn't work up here then? Well, in the wintertime, you know, you've, the blue cats, that's, you know, that's a time you want to go for targeting blue cats specifically. And the more cold it is, musky. If, you're li- if the eyes on your rods are not freezing solid, you're not fishing for musky properly. Seriously, they're really yeah. a cold. When it, when it gets cold out, that's when the big ones, that's when I caught that 52 incher was, wow. you know, in the middle of winter time. We, I mean, like literally, I did three or four videos in a row for my YouTube channel and the eyes were freezing on my rods when we were during that time frame, like the eyes were freezing up. So that's kind of our January, February window. What starts to happen around here, March, April, when we start getting the into flat The flatheads start waking up. You got the flatheads, the bass, like largemouth bass or whatever, they start trying to spawn. Even the stripers try to spawn during that time frame. But, you know, like the flatheads start waking up. I remember uh, Ty Conkle with FB Catfish. I like fishing with him a lot. And literally, he, th- you know, he w- I went fishing with him. And he thinks like they wake up in April. If it's March 30th, they're not awake. <laughs> I mean, literally. There's an alarm clock. Like we went fishing April 1st and he literally had fished the day before, the week before and no flatheads whatsoever. That trip we were catching flathead, flathead, flathead. So it's just like, boom, they woke up on April 1st. <laughs> Which so. ironically is the, the day that they open the season up some on stripers too. Mm-hmm. I guess striper fishing starts to get good around that time too. Yeah. Yeah, they start going up the rivers trying to spawn and stuff. You know, usually they're kind of I think they're more synchronized with the blues. So like late April they start going up rivers and so do the blues and stuff yeah. about that time. So And I guess one of the things here on these this whole system is kind of unique to other lakes, rivers with dams on them, all this stuff is navigable. You can literally get in a boat in Knoxville, Tennessee and go all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, yep. connecting through, locking yep, through. through the locks and everything. But you can't go north of Knoxville. Right. Um, I can't. Yeah. I can't. I got a jet boat, <laughs> so I got the cheat code to get up to Douglas Dam. I could drive from Knoxville and make it all the way to Douglas Dam. There's several ripples on the way, so I, I'd have to hit them just right. But yeah. I can do that with my jet boat, but not most people can really do that. What is the Tennessee River like as far as just water flow fluctuations in water? I've been out here, I I fish this occasionally, and I've seen everything from, there ain't no water moving, it's like the rivers are like a lake, all the way up to it's flooding. What is this place like? It just, it depends on TVA how they run the dams. It depends on the rain. We're getting a lot of rain. They're draining the lakes fast because they use the, the lakes as storage for the water. So in order it to be storage, they need to drop it two feet really quick. So they start you know, opening up the floodgates and everything. And that causes a lot of current. And sometimes you, know, you get good bites during that time frame. And sometimes, like when we get a lot of rain, then that's when you start seeing the flooding. Like the Teleco Dam has a ramp that's right below Fort Loudon Dam, and you launch there to get the closest point to Fort Loudon Dam below it. And you know when they've got that water rolling, and we got a lot of rain or whatever, literally the it, that's underwater, almost completely underwater right there. Oh wow, that's amazing! Yeah. That you got stuff coming out. And that's also a a scary time, too, because people will try to get up to the boils of it. And almost every year there's a boat that gets flipped. Talk about that a little bit, because I see that repeatedly happen. Some of my friends out here have been a part of the rescues and the recoveries on those deals. People want to go to the dam and fish because there's fish. But explain to people what exactly happens there as far as just how bad it can get. Well, uh, the last, uh, I'll talk about the last boat accident that I know, know about that happened there. And these guys, you know, they were trying to fish the boils like other boats. And explain what the boils are, because some people that are new to this have no clue what that is. Just think rolling water, like the, you know, it comes down. You have two different types of boils, really. You have the turbine, so the water is coming up and it's boiling up. 
And then you have the spillgate boils, which means it's going down, causing, you know, a, a, a hydraulic effect. Yeah, the water circle. Yeah. So you get in that, you get too close, and it knocks your boat over. You're just you're in a washing machine. Yeah. You're not if you have, I mean, it will rip off if you have a personal flotation device on. It rip that off your clothes. It rip all your clothes off, and you're just sit there spinning. The people I've talked to, my friends who've helped rescue these people, said most of them are stripped completely yeah. out of their clothes. It is that violent of a water. Yeah. And it's like you were saying, there's a hydraulic effect. It's almost like a counterclockwise spinning wheel that just when you think you're getting sucked out of it, it washes you back the, into the it. The last wreck, they weren't even really too close to it. They lost engine power. And they had time to dial 911 as they got close to it. And they were trying to wave other boaters to help them or whatever, but they just, it floated them in there. Did, you know, 911, they're not going to get to them fast enough. The other boats wouldn't be able to get to them fast enough either. They just floated into it, boom. I think they both, they both died on that too. They were wearing PFDs and everything. It just motor died and they got sucked in. Yeah, because there's a requirement to wear PFDs up there, but most people wear the little thing around your waist, the self-inflatable yeah. that just gets sucked yeah. right off of you yeah. if you go into even, that. Even kind of even the full size one can too. Yeah. So. What's a good is there a rule of thumb as far as when to go up there and not to go up there? I mean I went up there, I I avoid it whenever it's spilling. I mean I had the big pro cat. And I went up there one time. I didn't go all the way to the boils. All I went to was the, the wing wall to the um, lock. The lock. And it's a really, really, really long yeah. wing wall. So it's yeah. like a you know, football field away from the spelling gates. And that's as far as I went. I was like, no, no. I, even with the big boat, it can handle it, but it was just too you much never for know. me. So I turned around and I went You never know when something's gonna go wrong. I, yeah. And I've heard that story too many times up there, whether it be a motor failure, uh, they don't have power trim, and you throw it in reverse, and you know I've heard all kinds of horror yeah. stories up there. Now, I house. stayed there for a few minutes too, just trying to fish it or whatever, just the lock area, getting away from that. And there was a bass boat with like three guys in it, and I remember just watching. It's like bass boat under underway, bass boat, bass boat. He was literally taking on water, and they kept going up and down and up. And then I'm like, what are these guys doing? It's like they're just asking for it. And like literally, literally, I could watch the waves just, you know, they were going under the waves. It was so crazy. And I was like, I give up. I'm getting out of here. Uh, that's smart move. How do you decide where the fish is? There's so many, like when I've been up here and I'm around Lenore City, you got three lakes right there. Mm -hmm. You can drive 40 minutes down the road and you got Chickamauga. You can, how do you decide where to fish here? Well, they do, I mean, they do move around. So like, like I was saying earlier, springtime, they're, starting to move their way up river and then the, you know they're trying to feed for the spawn and then when they spawn you know they're, they're going back down the river and just you know they vanish you usually can't find them yeah. and then like summertime they're everywhere uh, but they're sluggish you know you just have to find like the feeding like certain areas like they like going into the backwaters to feed so I, that's why I like, you know, setting up in really shallow water right as the sun's going down because they're coming in there, feed, you catch a few nice ones. I haven't caught anything monstrous, but I, I do know sometimes you do. And then they leave and then there's nothing. So they kind of roam around everywhere. And then same thing in the fall, they start feeding up for the fall, especially flatheads. That's when they start feeding up, getting ready for winter time because they you, usually shut down during the winter time, but not always. I caught like on January 1st, like a year or two ago, I caught like a 30 pound flathead in 30 degree weather. And I think the water was like 38 degrees or something. And I just, big old flathead. And I, I, you know, the rod didn't do much. It just did this and like, you know, that's a little fish. Reeled down like, that's not a little fish and reeled in the big 30 pounder. He's just like, okay. And I was catching a bunch of baby blues, like little blues or whatever. You know, I had big baits out and then, you know, I see peck, peck, peck and couldn't catch anything. So I cut down the bait, started catching little blues with the little bitty bait. I kept a couple of big baits out and the flathead decided I must have, I must have hit him on the head. That was the only way he would have fed. So he just ate it and just was like, why can't I move? You know, it's like sluggish and rods just going down. It's like, well, what's going on with this rod? If you had to pick one lake here to fish for catfish, which one would it be and why? Watts Bar. 
and it's because it's you've got so much going on with watch bar you've got deep air deep lake areas you've got river areas you got cold water you got a steam plant um you know 15 years ago wasn't good they had the big ash spill there but since it's kind of recovered since then a lot of that stuff is still in the water but it's more like in the sediment or whatever so it's only in the fish and the sediment at the moment it hasn't like you know it's not clouded up the water to kill the fish like it did back then but it's still in the fish there's you know i would never eat a single fish out of watts bar ever but the fishery is just it's so diverse has so, so many different things going on there it makes it like a great catfish area and that's because there was catfish what there lake. was an ash pond that broke loose on mm -hmm. the emery river is that right yes yes and it dumped all that yeah ash you remember the where we fished and yes. we caught those 240 pounders back to back yeah. I, I didn't even expect that I, I guessed that i was like i bet they're going to be here and yeah. 240 pounders back to back and you got to think we were sitting in the boat that the ash wall that went over the, where we were at, we would have been under. It Are was you like, serious? It was like 15 feet high, just right. going down the Emory River. So we would have just, you know, been underneath ash there. That's amazing. That is fascinating. For people that don't know, we did a video together a couple years ago. It's on my channel, fishing up there. And you parked us on some good, good fish on that trip. How did they get that ash out of there? What was that? Did they dig all this they stuff? They dig out? it. They dredged it. A lot of it, you know, still went into the system. I mean, the, that Emory River, that was the Emory River runs into the Clinch and runs into the Tennessee River. Right. So a lot of it just got mixed up in the water and went down the Tennessee River. But a lot of it went on the banks and on the bottom there or whatever. So they tried dredging as much up as possible. You know, I've seen, I've seen videos about that and, and when it happened, but I didn't realize it was that massive, that far down as to where we were. Yeah, that is crazy. yeah supposedly it like, it like dammed up the Emory River too, so it flooded because there was so much. Amazing, amazing. Uh, what is Watts Bar? Describe Watts Bar to people that aren't from up here. It is a, from dam to dam, it's a massive waterway. Yes, it is. And there is a lot of different stuff in there. Is there areas that you like better than others or? I like the upper area the better than others just because, you know, Emory River, Clinch River, Tennessee River, just uh, around Kingston, the Kingston confluence. I mean, I've, heard, I've seen people catch monsters right at above the dam in that area. And even like, uh, there's an area called Thief Neck and it's just, it's a loop. It's a giant island owned by TWRA and there's just you know a lot of deep water around there some underwater creeks coming into it it's that's a good catfishing area that I haven't actually I've explored it a couple of times just like when I was breaking in boats I'd drive all the way there and just you know sonar here sonar there it's like oh that'd be a good spot that'd be a good spot and just drove around it but I've yet to actually catfish thief neck but there's some now, I, my buddy Clint told me that he used to go there with his dad or his grandfather. I don't, I don't remember. It might have been his dad. And they would catch like two to three pound bluegill in that area yeah. in the summertime. All right. But now in the summertime, it's a, uh, a party zone. Like there's just party boats everywhere and wake boats or whatever. So it's kind of turned off the area. It's hard to fish in the summertime. Well, you, because of that lakes here in the summer are all of them crowded and oh, they are pretty much crowded now so it's like you have to find those pockets to hide to catch the fish because staying out in the in the middle of the lake is just asking for it it's just a washing machine even with the big boats it's it's hard you get there early morning or late at night when they're when they're done or whatever it's a good time to fish but you you know you can't do all day at a, at a main lake or you're going to take on water, yeah. even in a big boat. Now tell me a little bit about your YouTube channel, because it led to some other things that we'll talk about. You started out as panfish. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that, why panfish, and what did it evolve into? Well, uh, you know, it was kind of, a, kind of a nickname, Panfish Bill. And, you know, I, I did plan out the YouTube channel a little bit of how I'm going to do this. I reached out to Joe with Chat Cats Fishing, to fish with him, you know, to collaborate, because I knew collaboration helped channels grow. And then I also got the, the domain panfish.net. 
So if I met anybody, I was like, yeah, check out, just go to panfish.net that goes directly to my YouTube channel. And it still does. I still have panfish.net and I, I have it going directly to my YouTube channel. And that's, that's how I started, you know, just the basics. I had a YouTube channel before my um, fishing one. It was a motorcycle channel. And it, I did not know this. Yeah, it wasn't that much of a success. I made up, I got up to about 60 subscribers on it. And all it was was just me riding a motorcycle and I put music to the video and that was it. Okay, okay. So okay. it wasn't really, it wasn't a motor vlog or anything like that. It okay. was just me riding the motorcycle and learning YouTube at the time. Okay. Uh, I ended up deleting the channel. I had, you know, I had the speedometer on there a couple of times and you see the, the sign the going by saying <laughs> what the speed limit was. So I decided, you know, you know, it's not really doing anything. Yeah, it's smarter to get rid of that. Yeah. Now you changed the name. Yep. Panfish. I went to fishing with Billy. You know, I'm not always chasing the little fish. I, I don't mind catching them. Right. I've got several videos where I'm targeting like baby blue cats specifically just to try to catch the smallest blue cat possible. But I like catching the big fish too. Yeah. And I've got a lot of big fish on the channel. You fish for a lot of different stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, yeah. you're, you're not locked into one thing. And yeah. Just... Mainly catfish, but, you know, I'd still, you know, I may go musky fishing again. I'm trying to, Joe with Chat Cats Fishing, he wants to go musky fishing. So whenever he gets time, we're going to go out and see if we can land a musky. Very cool. Very cool. Joe's a great guy, yeah. a great fisherman, a great one to have. Now, that kind of led to getting into doing some guiding. Yes. What, what made you start and decide to do that? Well, uh, you know, I've had a boat all my life, and I've actually started a captain's log literally when I was a kid. So that gave me enough hours to finally, you know, get... You started the captain's log as a kid. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. yeah. And it, it's, uh, you know, you have to have, I think it's 390 hours. Yeah, and so many or, within or the past three days years. days yeah. logged as a captain or whatever, logged on a boat. So I finally hit that mark. And also, you know, started fishing and talking with Melton Hill Bill. Mm -hmm. And he was, he helped me, he told me how his guide service works and helped me learn the ins and outs of like guiding and stuff. So through my previous experience talking with him, I decided might as well get my captain's license and start doing some guiding. And what do you guide for? Because you've got a lot of options up here mm -hmm. as far as what you can what, Whatever, fish. you know, I default to catfish, but someone says, let's go after musky or let's go after carp or even crappie or whatever, I'll do it. So I just, I target whatever they want to do. And if they don't have, you know, if they just want to go fishing, which the majority of them just want to go fishing, you know, we'll just go catfishing. Yeah, go uh, catch fish. Go catch fish. I don't fish. consider myself like the best guide. Uh, you know, there's guides out there that can literally, you know, they don't, even the other guides, they don't guarantee like the big fish, but Nobody like, does, yeah. but Ty, I mean, he literally will cut like a hundred pound fish and then hundred pound fish on his next trip and then another hundred pound fish. He has, you know, there's, there's ones that have more experience to the certain areas they fish. So I'm still, you know, I know I've been learning Watts Bar and that's been like where I guide because I know Watts Bar more than anywhere else. I've tried, you know, I do know some places like on Fort Loudon, but I, you know, because of the apartment buildings going down the, that river in the summertime in the wake boats, I tried to avoid it. So, yeah. and then Melton Hill, Melton Hill has been, you know, the one that I fished the most when I was a kid and even now is the one I fish the most, but it's also the one I know the least amount, least, you know, least about. There's big 50 pounders in there big 50 pound blues and stuff, but they're, they're so like rare. So I, I've been trying to like learn that lake and you know, it's not teaching me anything. <laughs> it's not letting me it's figure gotta it out. It's gotta be hard to figure. I mean, the learning curve up here has gotta be tough mm -hmm. because there's so much water mm -hmm. and there's so much of it that when you look at it on a chart or a map or an aerial mm -hmm. picture, you go, yeah. My God, that's a good place to fish. I mean, it's got to be challenging for you guys it, up there. It, it can be. I've been one of the things I I haven't really mentioned much. I've been trying to learn sturgeon. I want to catch a sturgeon. Y'all have sturgeon too. What else do you? I, I mean, I took I took a <laughs> one of my clients. I took to a certain spot, and literally we were going to just go for catfish. He caught his personal best striper that day, and it's like. You know, wanted catfish striper he was happy his personal he never caught one that big i'm probably a 30 pounder yeah 
And when we pulled up to the area, we had this six-foot sturgeon almost jump into the boat. And while I was fishing there, six-foot sturgeon jump, six-foot sturgeon jump. I was like, I wish I brought night crawlers. I mean, there was just like, and I cut down one of the baits, one of the skipjacks, really small, and I launched it in the direction of where they were jumping. And something pulled down, the client grabbed it, and he's like, man, this is like a giant log, and then whew, nothing. And it's like, man, that must have been one of them. So I've been trying to unlock the sturgeon. I've spent, I mean, I've spent hours, days, just trying to go up like different rivers or whatever, trying to like find the sturgeon because they have a certain pattern. Like uh, this was from Northwoods Angling, Luke. He yeah, told me this, yeah. and you can see them on the sonar. They feed specifically, like you see them as like an angle when they're feeding, and they like feed in a line. So you see angle, 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 a bunch of sturgeon just in a line feeding. And if you can find those spots where they're doing that, they come back to them over and over again, and you can catch sturgeon. But I haven't, I haven't unlocked the secrets to them yet. I've been trying, so. So, what does sturgeon eat? I mean, what do you throw out for bait? I've never talked to Luke about it. I know he fishes yeah. for them. What, what do you throw out night for Night crawlers, you cut up, like, night crawlers and smushed minnows. Like, you take from what they do. I mean, this isn't really a secret. They've talked about it on their videos before, and he's told me, or whatever. But you put on, like, a piece of night crawler, a piece of smushed minnow, a piece of night crawler, a piece of smushed minnow, and you just fill it up with a gob of bait and throw it out there. Wow, and just a Carolina rig on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep, yeah. yeah, and they just they just suck it up and eat it. I've got I've got a whole bunch of small hooks too. Like a lot of people will use like five aught hooks for it. Mm -hmm. I use eight aught hooks on mine, the Team Catfish double action circle hooks, and I've got a whole bunch of like five aughts that I haven't actually. Like, How used big are yet. the sturgeon here? Well, they've been they've been stalking them. It's called sturgeon fest. They stock like 300 to 1,000 like a year or more, sometimes up to 3,000 a year in the French Broad River. And they've been doing it for a while. And like I said, I've seen like literally, they look like six footers. I mean, jump, that sounds heavy. That water. sounds big. Big. That, I mean. That is crazy. Big, big fish. And they all have, this is like, the, it's like a, just a menagerie of like freak fish, fish <laughs> up here. You got sturgeon and then you got paddlefish. Mm -hmm. What's the deal with paddlefish? I know a spot. <laughs> you for know them a lot too. of spots, apparently. Oh, I didn't know what these fish were, right? I'm looking on the sonar and just hundreds of just big marks. I'm like, that's got to be a bunch of catfish. I throw out catfish bait, sit there, nothing. I'm like, what are these? Okay, maybe they're buffalo. I actually took carp bait there one time, nothing. And then I talked to a buddy, and it's like, yeah, I know exactly where that's at. We took and we started, you know, with big hooks or whatever, paddlefish. Describe There's to people what paddlefish are. Paddlefish. Describe to people what paddlefish are. They're a, they're a filter feeder. So all they do is they, they have this big paddle on their nose. Supposedly has like, they can feel like the electricity or whatever, or something of the, of the fish in the water. And they just open their mouth wide and just swim. And it, whatever goes in there is what they eat. So they're almost like a basking whale or a basking mm -hmm. shark or something like that. Yeah, that's some, just... Sometimes you can catch them on like chunk bait or whatever, but it's, you know, it's got to be hanging there and they just accidentally swim by and get hooked. Most of the time they're snagged. And I was going to ask you, how does the snag, you hear people like going snagging for paddlefish. Mm -hmm. How does that work? That's pretty much the only way to purposely catch them. And we have a like a certain time of year. I don't remember. It's like April and May that it's we have a paddlefish season. paddlefish season or whatever. And the only way you can really catch them on purpose is snagging. And during that time of year, they're coming up to the dams pretty thick. So you just throw it out there and you just reel, 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 and just until you finally like snag one. What do you do with the paddlefish? Do you eat them? You you can. The caviar is really good. Um, and you can, you can eat them too. You can cut them up and eat them. They're pretty, they're pretty edible. I haven't ever ate one myself, but I know that they're, you know, people can eat them. Now I would assume the sturgeon are catch and release. Yes. They're considered critically endangered here in Tennessee, the lake sturgeon. And so I don't know if I could actually legally like guide for them. I've been, I've been wanting to guide for them, but you know, I have to find out a pattern before I could even do that. Right. And if I can figure out the pattern, 
then I might start talking with TWRA. Maybe, maybe they're ha- you know, I'd be like, I offer my services like, look, I'd love to guide for them, and I know they're critically endangered. What if I start like tagging them? Catch or and tag, to do some type of tag or for them, and then I can start like logging where I catch them, and you know, if I'm re-catching any of them and stuff like that, and their sizes, and give maybe you know, do a trade-off with TWRA, do a tagging system to allow me to, you know, take you know, people out to catch them if I can figure out the pattern. That's, do they uh, stay in the lakes? Do they migrate through they the They migrate. Lots? They migrate through the entire system. Even on TWRA's website where they talk about the sturgeon, they can release them. They release them at the French Broad, but they could end up like, you know, in Chickamauga. Mm-hmm. Or even, like, the, the weird thing was they said, like, you, they could end up in Norris. I'm like, how would they end up in Norris if you re- release them in the French Broad below Douglas? Because they'd have to go up like a feeder creek or something to get into Norris. So I don't know why they said that on their website. The way every fish moves, an angler puts it in his <laughs> live well and decides to stock the lake Maybe. for somebody. So. Maybe, but I mean, there, there might be like feeder creeks in the Norris or something, but like Norris and Douglas, they don't have locks, so they yeah. can't like go through a lock. So I, I don't, don't know why they put that on there, but you know, they can end up anywhere. They, might, they can migrate hundreds and hundreds of miles, but usually they do that. And then when they get old enough to spawn, then they will work their way back to the original area. Yeah. So they'll be working their way back to the French Broad. I've heard of um, the Little Pigeon River. There's a couple of dams and dikes and stuff up in there. And people have reported seeing sturgeon there just like eating off the sides of the walls of those dams. Yeah, really? And on Douglas, on Fort Loudoun, they've, people seen uh, every dam, literally every dam, people have seen sturgeon eating on them. So they're coming back pretty good. Yeah. How is the health of this fishery? I've heard, I mean, it seems like there's an abundance of everything. I've heard about declines in skipjack. What's your take on that? You've been around here fishing long enough. They move, skipjack move around. So I, I think there is, you know, it, there is kind of a decline in certain areas. They won't go back. And over time I've learned why, like Melton Hill Dam. I used to go there and just catch them like crazy there, like nothing. Rooster tails, that was my fish when I was a kid. I was catching little skipjacks on rooster tails. My parents would leave me there and I'd spend hours there just catching skipjacks and releasing them. I didn't really know what I had, you know, what I was catching at the time. The sweet bait. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Technology, what do you, first electronics on the boat and then we'll get into <laughs> internet technology. Uh, technology on the boat, some of the new stuff, good or bad? Um, it's good for the fishermen, like live scope. I have used and seen live scope in action and I almost consider it a cheat code because you can literally, you can see, oh, look, there's fish swimming there, fish swimming there. And then as they're swimming, you can be like, you cast right on top of them, catch the fish. But you can literally measure that that fish is 30 feet from the butt. Yeah. Yeah. So you're just, you're just seeing the fish actually swimming around. So it is kind of a cheat code, but you can see them. It is expensive technology, but it's well worth it. What about social media online? It's not so much websites anymore. There's not so much the catfish one and all that stuff, but Facebook, it, it, in one sense, you say, oh, the bite's on. You can tell when flatheads wake up now. You know, it's like, oh, flatheads are awake, it's time to fish for them. But also, it's like, it, it, there's, it can burn holes. Yes. What's your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, it's good and bad at the same time for fishing and fishermen or whatever, because there are some people that will go out and they catch as many fish as they can to put in the freezer. I mean, I, I like catfish. I like eating catfish. But, you know, if you have fresh catfish, it tastes so much better than like frozen. I really don't like frozen catfish. It really kills the flavor. But there's people out there will, will try to catch, you know, if they find a spot, or find your spot where there's a bunch of catfish or catch as many as they can to fill up their freezers. But that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is like the pay lakes. You know, they're coming down here, you know, they've literally thousands of pounds of trophy catfish they put in their ponds like every, every month, maybe even every week. And hundreds of, most of them die. They, you know, they're pulling out dead fish every day, every morning before they get their clients, they're rolling out the wheelbarrows, pulling out the dead fish. And they've, you know, they're mostly like in Kentucky and Ohio. 
And the Ohio River, you know, the tournament directors and stuff has noticed a significant decrease in the size of fish out of the Ohio over time. And these, they've been reaching out and going further, coming here to Tennessee to Watts Bar, going down to Alabama. They were recently caught in Alabama. Uh, Alabama and Tennessee, I think it's Alabama. It might have been Georgia. I don't know. It's one of the two. Mm -hmm. And we have the I've same, that, yeah. same laws where you can only keep one trophy sized fish and you can't transport it live. And they found them with a bunch of live fish. So they released the fish, gave them a big hefty fine, but they're, they're still doing it. I think it's because the money is good enough that they, they don't mind getting the fine every now and then. It's just a gamble of, uh, yeah. uh, that they're willing. Do you think we, as fishermen, hardcore, posting our pictures, doing our YouTube videos, are contributing in a way by creating this lust for these big fish? I think so, a little bit, yes. I mean, I've seen, I've caught a few fish with like hooks that are undersized in them where they broke somebody's line or whatever. Love some people, you know, they think get a big cat fever rod and then put a, you know, two-aught hook on it, throw a big old piece of, piece of skipjack out with their 20-pound line and then suddenly the line breaks to something. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, they're going, some people are going out there under geared or a lot of people are trying to do it, which can stress out the fish. Yeah. And um, example, Fort Loudon Lake. Fort Loudon Lake, ha you know, that's been decreasing. And I think it is partially due to commercial fishermen. I've seen them out there. They're only allowed to keep buffalo, but they're keeping catfish. They've been caught a couple of times keeping some of them keeping catfish. The commercial fishermen are doing it, but also the regular fishermen are. Uh, there was a, it might have been a, there was easily a state record caught, like, a year and a half ago or whatever i saw i saw the guy on facebook begging like does anybody have a scale and i was working i couldn't come see him i knew where he was at and he he couldn't find anybody with a scale for this fish so he measured it i don't remember the measurements but when i put him into the calculator 130 pound blue wow and he took a picture of it with him like it was on the ground because there's no way he could pick it up and then him and a couple of buddies put it back in the water let it go I think that same fish was caught in upper Fort Loudon Lake. It looked like the same fish. They took a picture of it. You know, sometimes you can't identify blues are the same because they have certain markings and stuff on them. And they said that they released it, but they had a stringer through its gills. Mm. So I think, you know, that fish was removed from the system. So it's not going to get any bigger because you don't put a rope through their gills for any reason unless you're wanting to keep it. Right. And Fort Loudon is, has a nickname, Fort Nasty. It is a really, really badly polluted lake. Yeah. So it is what it is. It is, and it's good that we got stewards like you of the resources that are promoting catch and release and teaching people how to fish, teaching people how to catch fish, but also releasing, you know, and putting fish back, putting a trophy fish back. People that are going to want to fish with you, how do they get a hold of you? I know you probably got a couple different ways. Tell them. And folks, I will put all this in the description. But sometimes if you hear it, it sticks in your head. How do they get a hold of you? Um, I do have an email, billy at fishingwithbilly.com. Mm -hmm. That's usually how people get a hold of me. But I do have a website, billy at fishingwithbilly.com. And I actually built that website myself, so I'm kind of proud of, of it a little bit. A little I am techie, a little bit on little, the nerd side, a little, a little bit on the tech side. I like... So you fishingwithbilly.com. Yes. That's all you got to remember. And again, it'll be in the description section uh, on the YouTube video and also on the podcast. Yeah. Dude, I appreciate you sitting down with me and talking. Well, there you go, folks. A fun chat with Billy. Some of y'all may know him as, as Panfish Bill on YouTube. That was his previous YouTube channel. Now it's Fishing with Billy. So uh, it's, he's still on YouTube, still putting out videos, still putting out content. So go check him out. I'll have those links down in the description below where you can check it out. And uh, I'm going to try to get back out there and fish with him here uh, before we get into the fall deer season uh, and see what we catch. Who knows? We may go catch stripe or sturgeon, paddlefish. Who knows with him? He chases them all. But until then, we'll catch you out on the water. Well, folks, if you made it this far, thank you for watching. Here are a couple more videos that I think you're going to like. I'd watch that one and then that one. No, 
Now do, do that one first and then that one. I, I don't know. Just watch them both. They're both good. 